Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Colin Marshall. Colin previously hosted the podcasts The Marketplace of Ideas and Notebooks on Cities and Culture. Now living in Seoul, he writes for publications like Boing Boing, Open Culture, the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, and the New Yorker. Colin, it is so great to have you on the podcast and to hear your voice again. Thank you. Great to hear you both as well, both of whom I've interviewed on those podcasts you mentioned long ago, (laughs) years ago. Yes, I'm so delighted that you're back with us and can't wait to hear the cool things you have to share with us. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. And I love that your first pick is a language as a tool. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I heard on one previous episode, this was a good chance to catch up on cool tools before coming on. I heard a guest pick written language itself. So I figured, well, if he can pick written language, I can pick a specific spoken. language, indeed. <laughs> and spoken and written, I suppose. I picked the Korean language because I live in Korea. I live in Seoul. I've lived here for the past five years. Almost exactly. I think I clicked over to five years in the middle of last month. But, you know, the Korean language, I say, don't come to Korea without it. That should be its slogan. <laughs> but, you know, uh, if any, either of you, I don't know if you've been to Korea. You're both pretty well-traveled guys. Uh, I maybe, have. I was uh, in Korea in the early 70s oh man I, i've got and, to hear i've got to hear more stories yeah. of this. oh my gosh i have such stories about that and because i was well and then I, I i returned later in the 2000s um very briefly but um uh i i know well i don't remember any korean whatever korean i knew i have forgotten <laughs> were you living here no no how long were you here just traveling here but you, did just you meet any meet any expats here or any foreigners at all well, when I was there originally, um, there were no expats there. Ah. I mean, th- this was in the early 70s. The war was long over, um, and I was not even in Seoul. I was in outside of Seoul and only came through Seoul to, to leave. Um, so uh, I have to say it was very undeveloped at that time. Yes. There were people living in, you know, thatched homes in the countryside uh there was no infrastructure it was actually difficult to travel because there were very few hotels to stay at um but that's you know that's a completely different world than it is now i i'm very aware of that so anyway Things have certainly changed, but I always like yes. hearing stories from, especially foreigners who have been here a long time, because the guys who've been here since then, since the 70s, they all yeah. came as big missionaries, or, yeah. uh, for example, there was one famous Peace figure who just, who just, yeah, Peace Corps as well, but uh, one uh, the guy named Kevin O'Rourke, who just died uh, last month, I believe, he was here mm-hmm. for 50 years, he was a Catholic priest, turned wow. literary translator, he wrote a memoir that I actually revisited on the occasion of his death for the Los Angeles Review of Books, so I'm always thinking about sort of trying to connect myself to the the expats of the old days because uh, this bringing this back to the language those guys learn the language as a matter of course if you're living in korea in the 70s long term yeah. you really needed the korean language right, i would argue right. you still need it today but some foreigners especially westerners they managed to live here 10 20 25 years without you know, they, they can direct a taxi and they can order in a restaurant mm-hmm. and that's about it and i wonder how they do it because daily <laughs> life here daily life here would be impossible just to my experience if i couldn't speak korean it just it would be daily humiliation i would always have to right. be bringing a korean with me or always having to beg mm-hmm. somebody to speak english right, and th- right. this is not right. this isn't europe this is not an english speaking country korea does pile untold amounts of money into English education here, but it's all about passing tests. Uh, recently here in Korea and in, in Seoul and everywhere else, they had what's called the Sunung, a test that's like the SAT, but it's only one day a year. Every student takes it on that day, and if you miss it, TS, you have to take it next year. Uh, so tell us about the tools for learning Korean. Yeah, it's uh, so learning Korean is a different story. They spend a lot of money on English here with too little effect. Now, how can you learn Korean to uh, better effect? There's a lot of ways now that they nobody had in the 70s, for example. So, I, Mark, I remember hearing, uh, I believe your wife spoke about Duolingo on this show mm-hmm. not That's that long right. ago. Uh, yeah. Duolingo is, is new uh, in terms of, uh, it's a new 
its Korean language program is new. Of course, it has a wide variety of other languages, French, Spanish, uh, Japanese, uh, Mandarin, all of which I've also been using through Duolingo. But Korean, they brought Korean out recently. And the program there is pretty basic. It doesn't go as far as those other languages I mentioned. But I ran through it myself. I sort of speed ran the Korean program to write about it. And I would recommend it for somebody trying to get a handle on the basics of how the language works. It gets you started. But Korean as I discovered when I first started self-studying it right after graduating college, Mm -hmm. uh, there's just not as many materials out there as there are for other languages. But fortunately, because because of the internet, uh, because the internet, as they say, there is a lot of Korean language content out there, Korean content made for Korean listeners. So once you attain a certain level of proficiency in listening, and that's always a stumbling block, but once you can understand a little bit, you can start tapping into the world of Korean language content, Korean podcasts, Korean radio shows, Korean vlogs. There are so many. I mean, the, the Korea, South Korea, uh, of course, they're, they, it's overrepresented in just pure content. How much content South Korea makes is astonishing. Just come here to Korea, flip on a TV, flip through the channels. There's, they're making so much content, and that's on I the know. internet as well. I and so, my, 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 my wife has ruined my Netflix recommendation engine <laughs> because of all the South Korean dramas that she's been watching. Of course, I didn't even mention the dramas. Yeah, Netflix right, is carrying right. them now. There's hundreds yeah. of them, and so the only recommendations I get at all anymore is for another Korean drama. It's just <laughs> – I was just amazed about the quantity of, of them available. Have you tried uh, to watch any of these? I don't find them interesting, but she has seen so many of them, and one of them she has seen again and again, the uh, Rookie Historian. Uh-huh. And it was, oh, my gosh. Can you see that again? She, 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 it's kind of like comforter. She's like, I just want to see this. <laughs> One episode. Okay. So um, so, so you mentioned Duolingo. Is there another tool for learning Korean besides uh, Duolingo? Most of the major apps offer Korean language material. For example, there's a very popular one, Anki, A-N-K-I. Uh, mm-hmm. That's like a memorization app. You guys might have encountered it. I haven't Space used it repetition. much. Space right repetition. Ahead. Right. There's that and there's Memrise, M-E-M-R-I-S-E. Right. Which, I, which I use for my Chinese. Yes, yes indeed. That's, that's, it's, very, it's very effective for Chinese characters, which in Korean you can also, you know, as you know, Chinese is a lot like Latin for European languages. If you learn Chinese characters, you have a better grasp of Japanese and Korean and other languages yeah. derived from it, uh, which I've been struggling with, but uh, uh, I'm still working on it. But yes, there's the spaced repetition, Anki, Memrise. There's also this service, Talk to Me in Korean. Um, which launched a few years after I began studying Korean. It was at first a podcast, and it really helped just to hear these Korean language conversations every day in my ears on my iPod. But they've expanded greatly since they have videos, they sell books, all kinds of things. I think they've tried to make themselves the one-stop shop, though they do offer some free content uh, for Korean learners, people starting their self-study of the Korean language. And of course, there's more than ever, in part because of all these dramas you mentioned, plus K-pop and all that, that I don't know about. Uh-huh. So t- talk to me in Korean. Um, that is like a site, an Uber site that has a bunch of different resources, including you saying podcasts and and these other um, what, uh, podcasts and videos, and videos. books. Uh, yeah, they're a content maker, a content producer. Okay, all right. Okay. So have you ever heard of, there was, there was a Spanish language course called Destinos. Yes. And I've read your blog post about it. I remember that right. post. And, and another one on French. French in forget, action. Yes. French in action where they, you watched basically a, a drama, a soap opera yeah. that began in very, very simple language. And by the time you got to the end, you actually could follow what was happening in that foreign language. I'm wondering if there's an equivalent for Korean. I think the space is open because I, I myself have been re-watching French in Action over the past year because it, it appears online every so often. I think your blog post was a good 15 years ago, but it did t- it turn me on to French in Action, which has been a beloved institution in classrooms since the late 80s. But been re-watching it. And yes, Destinos I saw in school because I studied Spanish in school. And Korean, I think, still lacks something like that. It still lacks a video program taught only 
in Korean. Because as you know, uh, Destinos and uh, uh, French in Action both are only in their target languages, which is really the way to teach a language. Uh, anybody who has an experience learning or teaching a language knows that. But Korean, there are video programs you can look up on YouTube. There's one called Let's Speak Korean, which ran for a few seasons on TV here, but it's taught in English. It's not taught in Korean. It does have sketches, skits, but it's taught in English. So this is an opportunity for any content creator who wants to teach Korean. Make the French in action of Korean. Make the Korean in action. There's there's a market for it, I guarantee you. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so Duolingo right now and maybe Talk to Me in Korean are the two sites. So what's your second um, tool that you want to tell us about? My second tool is what I'm drinking right now, in fact. It's, uh, <laughs> it's an instant coffee called Kanu. And I know you you guys, are are you both coffee drinkers? I'm not a coffee drinker. I am, I'm a, like, a very passionate coffee drinker. So you probably recoiled when I said instant coffee, right? No, not necessarily. Um, I don't mind some certain instant coffees, and, and I'd love to hear about this one. Well, Korean coffee culture is... It's pretty astonishing. Well, the first time I came to Korea, one of the few things that really surprised me, because I'd always been I'd been living in Los Angeles's Koreatown for the past four years, so I'd always been going to Korean coffee shops there. But when I came here, I saw this place has more coffee shops than any other city I've ever seen. It's it's first of all the that joke about one Starbucks being across the street from another in a city like Seattle here it's actually true and it's fairly common and those Starbucks are surrounded by local chains national chains independent shops it's uh, somehow the Korean market cannot get enough cafes cannot get enough coffee shops <laughs> wow and some some are good some are less good I mean the coffee is good the coffee can be less good the Americano is the sort of coin of the realm in Korean coffee shops everybody orders Americanos I never ordered one once in America but here it's every <laughs> single day and when I'm drinking coffee at home I I, I drink the Kanu K-A-N-U they they've they produce a black Americano in little packets you just pour water in and you're good to go and this is the new generation of instant coffee in Korea, you might say. Before Korean coffee culture really exploded in the late 90s when Starbucks got here and then the imitators piled on and there was a third wave and all that. Before all that, people drank what's uh, the brand called Maxim or in the Korean pronunciation, Mekshim. It's these big packets of instant coffee, but they, they already include a lot of sugar and a lot of not cream, but I guess you'd call it whitener, the sort of cream powder. <laughs> and so you pour it into a cup and it's this very sweet, uh, very light in color coffee-like beverage. And every Korean over 60 still drinks it enthusiastically. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's become a bit passe because of this explosion of coffee culture, the spread of sort of the taste for less adulterated coffees. So with the Kanu straight ahead, black Americano, uh, you know, there's none of the sort of, there's none of the cringe factor of Maxim. And I've, I've enjoyed it. I never drank instant coffee in the U S but, uh, if I was traveling again, when I can travel again, when we can all travel again, I'll probably bring some Kanu along with me just in case. That and sounds great. Can you get it in the U.S. Do you, or is it only something you get, can get in Korea? It'll be in every Korean in coffee, grocery uh, store. Store, I think. okay. Yeah, and okay. I think I think both of you. I I I don't know about Hawaii. They probably last time I was in Hawaii, I think I only saw a few Korean stores here and there. But most major cities in the U.S. right have a Korean grocery store. We have a huge sure. Korean grocery store area right up the street. With, ah, uh, you'll find the it there. But yeah, you don't you drink, drink coffee. <laughs> I don't drink coffee, but but um, for traveling, I might you know for the other people in my family who need it, that might be uh, something I get. So um, Spotify, uh-huh. that's another one of your tools. Um, they're on a roll these days. Tell us about what you love about Spotify. Now, Spotify, it seemed at first it would be a too obvious a choice, but I actually haven't heard anybody on Cool Cool Tools mention Spotify. Have no, they? Has anybody done this? Have. I, th- I don't think they ever have. So I- I'd love to get your take on it. At least this is a first. So Spotify is already hugely popular in the US, has been for about a decade now, as I understand it. But it hasn't launched in Korea yet. It's just about to launch, but it hasn't launched. And part of this is because with every tech development these days, Korea produces its own, not just one equivalent, but multiple equivalents. So there are a variety of streaming services in Korea already, just like there are a variety of rentable scooters. Uh, whereas in the US, you have what, Lime and Bird. Here, it's like you go to a subway station in Gangnam and there's six different brands all serried out there in front of the station. So much wow. many competitors launched as equivalents 
of Western products. So mm -hmm. with Spotify, it's taken them a while to break that market, but they're about to. And what I enjoy about it, well, first of all, I should say, I do use Spotify here. I use it through a VPN, or rather I signed up through a VPN. I happen to use one called uh, TunnelBear because it offered free 500 megabytes. So I just signed in, signed up, and signed out again mm -hmm. of the VPN. But uh, mm -hmm. if you have an American or compatible credit card, you can sign up anywhere as long as you VPN in to uh, actually register. And I listen to Spotify every day. I, like most Americans, no matter where they are, I listen to it every day. But what I have come to enjoy about it particularly is it allows, it allows me to approach music in a way I wasn't able to before. So I listen to a lot of music, but I never listened to the Beatles until age 35, which was last year. Uh, <laughs> and because, wow. yeah, because it just seemed like the Beatles are so popular. There's no, there's, they are the image of a popular influential band. I don't need to listen to them. Other people have taken care of that. But I realized <laughs> uh, as I went on, the Beatles are a cultural nexus. If you understand the Beatles, they connect to so much else in especially Western culture, but not just the West anymore. And I figured, okay, how, how am I going to get to grips with the Beatles? And I realized, I realized I was coming up, we were coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Beatles breakup last April. And this was mm -hmm. enough in advance of that. I thought, well, if I listen to one Beatles album a week, every day, I'll have just enough weeks to finish by the 50th anniversary of their breakup. And I'll write a Twitter thread about it. It'll be great. So I did that with Spotify because of course they're all there. All the albums are there. Mm -hmm. I just started with please, please me, listen to that for a week. Second week with the Beatles, once a day for a week, continued on through Let It Be. And I've done the same subsequently with the Beach Boys, and now I'm doing that with the Rolling Stones, just going programmatically through the whole discographies of these massively influential bands. Because in part, I'm fascinated and have long been fascinated by the album as a unit of culture, the, the, the rock album or the pop album. And you can't talk about the album per se without talking about these three bands and how they competed, how they influenced each other. But I'm going to keep going. You know, I, This method of listening to one album a week through an entire discography, I'm going to do, I mean, it'll be David Bowie, Bob Dylan, Talking Heads, I'll just keep going, you know, that hopefully for the rest of my life, I can just keep picking one album a week, because Spotify has most of them, if not everything, most of them up there, it can just sort of click and you got it. So, so I think the innovation that, that you are kind of um, exploring a little bit is this, uh, the completest, this idea that you have the complete library, the complete archive of all music and you're able then to do this d d deep dive in a in a kind of very systematic way that was never really possible before because you require you going to collecting these first and then exactly. listening to them here they're all collected they're all at your disposal and you can do this very um programmatic exploration of any artist you want, which is a brilliant idea. I, I think it's fantastic. And it would have been hard to do 20 years ago, even in the US, but in Korea, I can't imagine how I would have pulled it off. And the funny thing is, you know, I'm glad to hear you. I'm glad to hear you think it's a good idea because there are many friends of mine who, when, when I told them I was going to listen through the entire Beach Boys catalog, they were quick to try to, to dissuade me from doing that. They, they would say, oh, you, know, you, you get past the 60s and it's all dreck. You're going to have to listen to Kokomo, you know. But I find it's, yes, of course, Kokomo is no good, but I found much, I, I like albums that are not well known, not well respected, mm -hmm. that are nonetheless interesting. And they, the Beach Boys have more than a few of those albums I'd never heard of, never heard any of the songs from, that I mm -hmm. nonetheless now think about with some regularity, and they fit in with the sort of cultural map that's been filling in in my head, even, even now, even here, as I go through these bands. That is so cool, Colin. That's that's brilliant. Yeah, I really wow. I really like that 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 idea of um, it's like going to visit a country. The country is the Beatles, or the country is the Beach Boys, and you're gonna you're gonna go through it, like on a tour. You're gonna tour their history in a ah, certain sense. Yes, indeed. I mean, do you do you guys have favorites among these three bands? I should get your opinions on who who do you side with: Beatles, Beach Boys, Stones. I'm a Beatles. Ah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, there are, there are certain songs that I like from the other two, but I would definitely let me put it this way: I have heard more Beatles than I have the, of the other two. I see. But I but, but Beatles aren't my aren't my favorite. But I'm just saying of those three. That's of those I three, think. yes. I would say the Beatles to me are like my favorite band and the best band. Mm. But of all I, time, yeah, of all time. But I can listen to the Rolling Stones 
forever and never get tired of them. But with the Beatles, I will get tired of them. The Rolling Stones, oh. for some reason, the songs, I, I, I never like, get bored. I could just hear them over and over again. So if I songs. look at my iTunes collection of music that I have bought, I have more Bob Dylan than any other anything else. So when you get to Bob Dylan, I'll be very impressed. He's next. He's next. I'm, when I finish the Stones, then it's Bob Dylan. With the Stones, I'm only on Aftermath this week, yeah. which is a remarkable album. But when I get done in six months or so with the Stones, it's on to Bob Dylan. Start a new Twitter thread. I'll be in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he he's deep in many ways. Um, but but I also uh, if I look at the the number of of played times, so I. I use um, a technique of putting certain um, songs on loop and I use them as a kind of a background to write with. Oh, so one, song. Have, one song. So I, so I have really high counts of some songs that don't really reflect uh, anything more than the fact that I use it as a, as a background loop. Do you have a go-to song to do that with, to work yes, to? Yes, I do. I do. What is it? It's uh, Bulgarian's Men's Choir Sacred chant hmm. that um somehow works on me and puts me into this zone where w- w- I, w- when i need to write really hard which is a kind of thinking for me i put that on and it'll just go on for hours is that a gregorian chant type music yeah uh-huh ah, yeah. That, gregorian chants had a big moment in the 90s didn't they, they for a while there they it came did. into the mainstream somehow right 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 yeah so tell us about your fourth uh, um, pick. Yes, indeed. My fourth pick, I was so glad when I was listening, catching up on Cool Tools, that people were choosing, were able to choose books because, I mean, I'm at core a writer and I'm thinking, I don't really, do I use any tools? I was worried I wouldn't have four tools because I was like, well, I got my, I have the MacBook Air every writer has and complains about the hard drive space of. I've got, uh, I've got the notebooks, I've got the Chrome bag, but I can't pick these things. These are cliches. So a book, I, if I were to pick a book, which one would it be? It would be uh, The World, a collection of pieces by Jan Morris, who recently died just last month. So even if you didn't read any Jan Morris before, you've probably heard of her because of her recent death at the age of 94. And Jan Morris came to fame uh, in the 1950s, accompanying Sir Edmund Hillary's, or then just Edmund Hillary's, uh, expedition to the top of Mount Everest, the first to successfully reach the summit. She was the embedded journalist at that time, although she was embedded as uh, James Morris, uh, the, uh, she was a man in those days and later on in the 70s made the journey to uh, becoming a woman. But that's only one of the many journeys she made in life. Uh, she wrote more expansively on the world and especially the cities of the world than any other writer I can think of in recent memory. And her portraits of cities like Hong Kong or Sydney or Venice, Trieste or Los Angeles even. She has a 70s essay called The Know-How City that uh, to me still does much to define Los Angeles. Even though I lived there, she just visited, and I'm writing my own book about Los Angeles, I still think of Jan Morris's The Know-How City as in a way one of the the, the peaks of recent, recent decades, last 50 years or so of writing about Los Angeles. But Jan Morris, uh, her writing if you want to start reading it, the world is one of the better introductions because it's an anthology, pieces from 1950 to 2000, at, after, at which point she stopped traveling quite as much, though she did keep writing till the very end, publishing diaries and whatnot. Uh, and it's it excerpts books and it collects essays as well, and it gives you a sense of the sweep of her work of 50 years and so much of the world she managed to write about. And as with uh, many, I, I call them writer, writers of place, as with many writers who write about place, uh, she used place as a sort of nexus of subjects. When you're writing about a country or a city, uh, you you can write about everything. You can connect everything to that. So in a way, place is a subject, but more so it's a way to write about all subjects, including oneself. And she certainly used place that way uh, right up until the very end. And um, as a the world, this book... Um, how would it be useful to people? What would you suggest that, uh, that people approach it for as a tool? Well, it became, I first bought it as just something to read. And it became a tool to me because I myself write a lot about place. I write about cities uh, more often than most subjects. So I've actually just turned back into this book at random just to find 
just to find ways to see ways that Morris approached cities. Whenever I'm feeling like I don't quite know how to, in writing, approach a place or how to frame something, I can just flip almost at random to one of her pieces, whether as James or as Jan, uh, any part of the world, about a city, about a country, any era, and I can get a sense of, oh, you can do that. It, it just, it shows, it reminds me of what's possible in writing about place. That's a way to put it. Her, her writing keeps reminding me what's possible. You don't have to you don't have to write perfectly straightforwardly in a travel writing sense about every place you go to. And Jan Morris uh, bristled at being called a travel writer. Uh, that's why I tend to refer to her as a, as a writer of place. And this just gives you a sense of how many possibilities there are in writing about place and how many, it hints at how many still remain. She by no means tapped that well dry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, great. That's perfect. That sounds so good. I'm now, getting it. I, I, Wonder if it, do you do you guys have any favorite writers of place? If, if I say that title, does that make sense to you? Do names come to mind? Well, you mentioned in your little write up, Pico Iyer yes. is a beautiful writer of place. Paul Thoreau, um, you know, there are a lot of great travel writers. I I like um, the recent some of the recent writers, Stuart, uh, who wrote about walking across. Oh yes, Afghanistan. R- no, um, he's now an MP in England. Um, maybe uh, not Ian Stewart, but um, uh, yes, there travel writers are a special breed, and to do it well, I know, is really difficult, and mm. I'm in awe of any who can do it. So, um, w- where would be the best place for someone to follow you? Do you have a place that you hang out, um, and do you want to talk about? something recent in the last couple of minutes that we have some uh, recent project of yours that you want to share with our listeners. Yes. I've recently started a, I've jumped on the Substack bandwagon with a, with a uh, newsletter called books on cities, which is about just that. I write about a sort of long form essay reviews on city books, new and old about cities all around the world. The last one was the architect Rem Koolhaas's Delirious New York, a retroactive manifesto for Manhattan. I'll write about Jan Morris's Hong Kong book later. I, I've written about, uh, there's a, this just this year, a history of the city by a historian named Ben Wilson called Metropolis came out, started there. Uh, I am currently working on a book on Los Angeles, as I hinted at, uh, the stateless city it's called, but still a very much a work in progress. But as for where I hang out, I've I've reduced my social media greatly, pretty much down to Twitter, of course, so the one you would expect. Uh, I'm at Colin Marshall there, and uh, the website is colinmarshall.org. Not .com, but .org. I couldn't get the .com. Okay. okay. That sounds great. Um, so... Colin, I, I am excited about your newsletter and also um, just about all the, the tools that you picked. It was so interesting and refreshing hearing about all of these and just yeah, great yeah. You're coming in a, with you as well. Right. You're coming in from a different angle, which we really, really cherish. And yeah. thank you for, for that. Um, it was a fun challenge to pick them, to find, to pick them, to come up with as, them. As always, as <laughs> always, particularly someone as accomplished as yourself. So thank you for sharing that with us. We really enjoyed talking with you. Wish we could be with you in Seoul. Maybe one of these years we'll be able to venture out again. When the virus um, goes away, come on out. I'll show you the best yes. place. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. I'll take you off on it. Thank you again. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's your co-host, Mark. And I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, 
Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week.